We got another great panel. This one is on the Lightning Network and building Lightning native companies. And we, all right, Lightning fans. Yeah, who has Lightning in their uh, in their Twitter bio? Lightning, Lightning bolts. Everybody put a Lightning bolt in there. Um, and follow these folks and follow me while you're at it. <laughs> We've got a really good crowd. It's uh, building Lightning native companies. Um, the first panelist is almost synonymous with Lightning. That's the OG Elizabeth Stark, CEO of Lightning Labs. We've got Miles Suter, who is a Bitcoin lead at a company you've heard of called Cash App. We've got another person you probably heard of, David Marcus, CEO of LightSpark. And the moderator is Mackenzie Segalos, who is a tech reporter at CNBC. So take it away, panel. Have a good one. Hey, guys. So I feel like this is a really interesting time to be talking to three of the biggest companies working in Lightning. You've got BRC20 tokens, ordinals, fees surging on the network. It seems like the exact use case uh, that you guys have been working toward building. Uh, David, you're newer to this space. I've got the OGs over here. I, I, was Lightning ready? Has it been ready? Was this the best thing that could have happened to the Lightning Network? I, I open that question up to all of you. Elizabeth, kick us off. First of all, so great to be back here in Miami with the community here. Um, the amount of progress we've seen in the Bitcoin and Lightning community has been incredible. And by the way, Bitcoiners build, right? Don't listen to anybody that says we don't do that. And we continue to build. Jameson Lopp has actually written about this. Um, he has a tweet where it says, when will Lightning be ready? And he responded in saying, software is an iterative process. So we're constantly improving it, constantly developing it. But we have hit a point on the Lightning Network where uh, you know, larger transactions go through. River did a great report around routing and such a high uh, rate of success, quite a bit higher than existing credit card networks that often fail. So we've really reached a point right now where Lightning is maturing, and we're seeing more and more adoption. We just heard some announcements today. I know we'll talk more about that. And people are onboarding to the network because it is solving real problems for them, including instant high volume, low fee transactions, especially in a world where there are other transactions on the blockchain that are keeping people from actually using it. I think it was a great stress test this week. I think it, um, or the last couple weeks, as we've seen the, the on-chain mempool get really filled. And I think it speaks to some of the challenges of non-custodial lightning, um, which we're working to get to improve and um, make a lot easier. And one of the things I'm most excited about at Block Inc. is a project called C equals, which is gonna allow non-custodial to get a lot stronger as a primary Lightning service provider. But at Cash App, during this storm, we saw, I was really impressed with our platform team, the way they responded. Uh, it was amazing getting to work with Matt Corallo and the LDK team as uh, we took this stress test and handled it really, really well. And so we've been seeing increased adoption month over month for ever since we launched. And um, it's really great to be able to offer millions of customers access to the Lightning Network for the first time from our custodial solution. And David, you launched a month ago. It seems like perfect timing, <laughs> given all yeah, the time. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you can't have a better ad for uh, our products and services uh, than uh, the mempool being clogged up and fees going up, because we have exchanges, wallet operators, who want to be on the Lightning net Network. They want to enable transactions that are faster and cheaper for their customers. And, uh, and it's still pretty complicated to operate your own node. And so they come to LightSpark and you know, we basically help them integrate in no time. Two days for the last partner who we announced today, which is Rain, a large uh, exchange in, in the Middle East. Um, and, uh, and it's really easy for them to onboard at a time where they really need to because the alternative is actually really uh, a lot worse than it was even weeks ago. So perfect timing indeed. What I think is especially fascinating about the three of you is it, you sit in different parts of the stack. Elizabeth, you entered the space in 2016, like virtually became synonymous with being a, a, a CEO of Lightning. 90% <laughs> of the There notes. is no CEO of the Lightning I know, I know. But like you started us off, and obviously we've had so many incredible players enter the space. Um, 
you know, David's newest to the table. We'll talk more about what, you know, brought you to Bitcoin and Lightning specifically in a minute. But my question is, I'd love to hear like these contrasting experiences. Miles, you're consu more consumer facing. Elizabeth, I feel like you're more of that like base, uh, you know, the, the base of the stack. David, you're somewhere in between. Like what is, and you've, you've entered at such different times. I mean, 2016 was a totally different time to be coming into Bitcoin and Lightning than it was in the last year. Yeah, so the way that I think about it, you know, for those of us in the Bitcoin community, we had to build the foundation before we could even build the building or really build the rails before we could build the train, right? And one of the things that I love about what we do in the Bitcoin and Lightning community is we're building things that nobody's ever built before. And we have a joke internally at Lightning Labs and our brilliant CTO, my co-founder, Lalu, a.k.a. Roast Beef, the fastest talker you have ever met. You have to listen to him at 0.5x. We say, okay, how long is this going to take when we're building up this new you know, aspect of our L&D implementation or something in the protocol? And he'll you know, say one month, and then of course it ends up taking longer. But nobody has ever built this before. And that's part of what's so exciting about what we do in this community. So we started off in the earlier days where really nobody had built this. Now there's an existing network. There's a whole ecosystem of all these Lightning Native companies building on it. You know, those companies, by the way, couldn't exist but for Lightning. Lightning enables their existence, which we'll get to. I know this is the subject of the panel. But at a high level, we are at now the point where we have built this foundation. We have built these rails. Now people are able to use the rails and build these compelling use cases, companies, cross-border payments, um, you know, use cases that couldn't previously be possible, machine-to-machine -machine AI type things with Bitcoin and the Lightning Network using this technology. And, and just a quick history lesson. Cash App was the first public company. I was literally just about to say that. Oh, no. no, that is, yes, go. <laughs> oh, well, so we were the first public company to support Bitcoin in 2018. Yeah. And in 2021, or 20, sorry, a year ago, we, uh, we were the first public company to support the Lightning Network. And we really viewed it as a strategic opportunity uh, because there's somewhat of a chicken and the egg problem. You need, in order to build out good use cases, you need people equipped to spend on Lightning. And so we, we really viewed it as a future-looking bet to kick off this virtual cycle. And one of the most exciting parts of this space is that a rising tide lifts all boats. So when I hear that David Marcus, president of PayPal, architect of Facebook Libra project, is entering this space, my first thought is not like, oh, oh crap, like he's going to cut into our market share. It's like, <laughs> hell yeah, let's grow this pie together. And um, that's what we need because it's so, so early. Yeah. And David, you raised, what, $175 million at an almost $900 million valuation last year. Tell us about, I mean, like in UK, I mean, like Miles just gave you, teed you up, like talked about uh, your four-year time at, at Meta where yeah. you're working on building Libra and then DM. Uh, Why did you choose to migrate to Bitcoin and Lightning? Yeah, so not well-known. First of all, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and, and the feeling is so nice. very mutual. Um, and, you know, we, well, not well-known fact. In early 2018, when we started exploring how we were going to potentially build a, what ended up being Libra and DM, uh, I uh, drove up to San Francisco to meet with Elizabeth to explore actually whether Lightning was the way to go. And at the time, we came to the conclusion it was too early, uh, especially because our intention was to enable fast transactions across WhatsApp and Messenger, et cetera, so it would have meant billions of consumers on the network. Wait, what year did you take that trip to talk to Liz? That was, uh, the, what year was yeah, it? Yeah. 2018, early 2018. I think it was January, February 2018. And, um, and so uh, then after trying really, really hard to do something else, because you know, we were really frustrated with the lack of the existence of a protocol for payments on the internet, and we tried a, a different tack, a different approach, uh, and you know, honestly failed at it because it was done uh, probably from you know, the wrong place in terms of regulators and government's appetites to actually approve something like this. Uh, so you know, December 21, I leave Facebook because I realized it's not going to happen, uh, and then went back full circle to Lightning and Bitcoin. Uh, and I've been you know, involved in Bitcoin at a personal level since 2011. Uh, but now I've, I've actually decided to dedicate the rest of my life in building on Bitcoin and specifically on Lightning because I've built this really truly unshakable conviction that the only network that can, the only protocol and asset that can actually support a truly open decentralized payment protocol uh, for payments on the internet is Bitcoin and nothing else. And, uh, and so that's it, you know? Woo! 
By the way, I, I too see Bitcoin and Lightning as a life journey, and I think for the community here, you know, Bitcoin is a way of life, right? So very happy to have you on board with this way of life. Do you, does a part of you wish that Facebook's ambition to launch its own stablecoin had succeeded? Are you glad that it failed? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, you know, I think right now I'm happy that I am doing what I'm doing. So I guess you know that answers part of the question. Back then, I would have hoped that it would have succeeded. I think you know it's just a, a longer road. But I'm, now I'm really happy to be focused on this because ultimately I think uh, you know at the end of the project we made so many concessions to appease uh, regulators and central bankers around the world that it wouldn't have been the open network that we all aspire to offer the world and to build for the world. And so I think that actually the right answer for the world is Lightning, is Bitcoin, uh, and not what we were building. So in that sense, I'm glad we're where we are today. Uh, on, I'm yeah. Sorry, on that note though, um, the mission at Cash App is economic empowerment. And I think there was something to what you were building because I think Shout out to Elizabeth and what they're working on on Taro. I don't know if that's, we, we need to explore lots of different use cases, but I do believe that what will bring economic empowerment to users all around the world, I think it's going to be some sort of combination of today's global reserve currency, the, the dollar, as a transition point to the global reserve currency of tomorrow, which I believe is, is Bitcoin. And I think um, the, the concept that you could have stable coins on the Lightning Network, I think if there's an app that can have those two things around the world. Um, I think it'll be highly successful and bring a ton of economic empowerment to a lot of people around the world that truly need it. Yeah, I always find that like most fascinating. The idea of Bitcoin as a payment network and sometimes being an invisible payment network and payment rail that people don't even have to think about. But you, you know, you, you kind of triggered a thought, Miles. In March, we saw the implosion of SVB. There was a banking crisis. This rippled um, across banks in the U.S. but also abroad. We saw this price rally follow, as as you know, the bulls would say that the exact use case for a decentralized digital currency outside the reach of a third party inter intermediary. The the case was proven for that. And my question is, uh, you know, when I think of the Lightning Network, I also think about it uh, replacing the existing system, like Bitcoin replacing the dollar. But is there, an, do we have to inevitably go through, like, or in terms of the work that you're doing, do you feel that it has to inevitably go through an intermediary step where, you know, we're seeing some banks integrate Lightning into what they're doing? So is it about, like, slowly augmenting the existing system being, you know, what you know, I think of also what Jack Mahler's is working on with Strike, being an invisible payment rail? Is that, what's the next stage? of development and, and what's the end goal here? Yeah, Cash App, we're all about giving customers choice for where they are in their journey. So obviously we have a ton of really cool fiat features. We have a lot of fiat integrated features that turn your fiat into Bitcoin and then allow you to use Bitcoin on a global scale um, as intended. And the thing I find most exciting about Lightning Network is what you mentioned. I see it as an emerging global monetary language where these fiat enabled banks in different geographies, they need to have three different things. They need to have like an entity in that country. They need to have fiat on and off ramp capabilities. And then if they speak that language of lightning, all of a sudden you can use Bitcoin, the network, uh, and Bitcoin, the asset momentarily to hop from one fiat to another across these different um, boundaries that previously made that really hard with capital controls. And so we're seeing kind of a Cambrian explosion of these different um, entities. Uh, one example is Yellow Card, a cash app portfolio company in uh, Africa that TBD has recently announced a partnership. Um, and there's Bitnob across Africa as well, but across so many different geographies, there are these regulated entities that are fiat connected, but also speak lightning. And I think that speaks to the power of this global network is this global interoperability. And to me, that's a really, really powerful thing. Yeah, yeah I'd and, like to chime in there as well. Um, so we at Lightning Labs have been working on a multi-asset protocol for Bitcoin and Lightning. On Tuesday, we just did the latest release, now called Taproot Assets. Um, Sorry. It does not, <laughs> unlike other protocols, um, clog up the blockchain, put lots and lots of data on there. It intentionally and very, um, brilliantly uses Taproot such that data is stored off-chain. Can, it can scale to many, many users. And the goal here is exactly what Miles mentioned to enable things like fiat you know, transfers on both the Bitcoin blockchain and then over the Lightning Network. Um, I coined the term Bitcoinizing the dollar. You hear of dollarized economies. Well, why don't we Bitcoinize the dollar? Use the security stability of the Bitcoin network in order to issue these stable coins and then 
the speed, scalability, and low fees of the Lightning Network to transact. So um, the latest release is out. If you're a developer, please go test it, start building. You can now build things like explorers. You can have multi-asset mints. And it's built with scalability in mind. And in fact, the creator of uh, BRC20 even said use tapered assets instead. It's more efficient. It's more scalable. Uh, mainnet is coming soon. Of course, can't promise exactly when, but we're working very hard to get this out to the world. Because as you mentioned, we believe that there's so many people globally that want access to the dollar. And that is an onboarding mechanism for Bitcoin, right? If you have your USD coin, you know, any stable coin on Lightning, then you also have your Bitcoin. And then people can actually be onboarded. And we have this intermediate step. But eventually, you know, we want to onboard all those people to Bitcoin. I see it as a transitionary step. Exactly. At, at Cash App, we, um, we like to think of the dollar, the fiat money as money 1.0, Bitcoin as money 2.0. and I, I personally see stable coins as money 1.5, as a transitionary uh, step in the right direction that ultimately supports the Bitcoinization of the world. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, it's kind of interesting because I feel like we often conflate asset and rails. Um, and the way we think about things is basically that, you know, a, a, a Satoshi traveling on top of Lightning is like a TCP IP packet for money on the yeah. internet, right? And so right now you can, of course, move SATs and Bitcoin, uh, but you can, either FX at the edges and enable consumers to actually pay in whatever fiat currency they want on top of the Lightning Network, or bring in uh, assets uh, like stable coins on top of Lightning to enable a uh, stable transfer of assets in real time at a very low cost on, a, on an interoperable open network. And to your point around bringing banks, I mean, we're really excited to bring the very first bank uh, onto Lightning uh, a few months ago with uh, Xapo onboarding on our stack and enabling payments for their clients uh, in Europe and, and, and in other parts of the world uh, to happen on the Lightning Network. And, and we certainly hope that there will be more and more banks moving onto the Lightning Network and use the Lightning Network as a real-time settlement layer between them instead of going through correspondent banking and SWIFT and all these things. It'll take a while because a lot of uh, banks uh, have uh, regulatory issues with touching anything close to Bitcoin. Uh, but that's not necessarily true internationally. And uh, I think there's a, there's a really interesting use case for moving value between regulated financial institutions. Yeah, and to that point, you know, I, I think it's fascinating. The one place where Elizabeth Warren seems to be uh, interested in the crypto ecosystem or a supporter is uh, in the context of potentially like disrupting existing payment rails that haven't been for what, 40, 50 years, more than that. I mean, David, a little bit earlier, you and I were talking about uh, ACH payment rails still accounting for what was the percentage of transactions? I think, you know, in terms of value of transactions, yeah. it's north of 50% of transactions in America are still r running on ACH that was built Built in the 60s or 70s, yeah. it takes three days to clear. That's wild, and like, yeah. and so <laughs> when I think about, and then like you think about the credit card payment networks, right? Interchange is uh, terrible for the merchant, and on the consumer side, you don't feel it as much because you get points and you get to use that to travel. Um, but when I think of adoption, and I want to come back to an earlier point that you made, Miles, in a second about global adoption and those borderless transactions because that's fascinating. But in the U.S., like, will the Lightning Network? I know that it's, you know, David, you're talking building toward that, but can it replace ACH payment rails and Visa and MasterCard and get rid of, solve some of these problems? And if so, what, what, what does it take to scale to that level? Yeah, I think, you know, so in the US, the, the issue of any new emerging payment stack or experience is the fact that consumers don't really feel a lot of pain when they're buying their coffee or when they're paying each it other. It feels great using an Apple um, Watch. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. It works. Yeah. Like no one actually, you know, thinks to themselves, "Gosh, I wish like I had a better way to pay for my coffee." Um, so I think we all collectively need to focus on areas that actually cannot happen uh, because the antiquated rails that we currently rely on cannot support these things. So. One interesting thing, one interesting concept that we're particularly in love with is this idea of streaming money. And what are the great use cases of streaming money in real time on the internet? Uh, and you know, we, we even have a demo on our website that shows streaming money from a consumer wallet that's just a, an open source, by the way, uh, Chrome uh, wallet extension running on Lightning and enabling consumers to stream sats to creators in real time as they consume the content that they've produced or engage in real time uh, broadcast. And we think that's kind of an interesting use case, but there are hundreds more use cases that are actually not possible 
because of the constraints of the antiquated rails that we depend on right now uh, with the alternative payment systems. And I think that's the point of focus. It's like, what are the use cases? Okay, cross-border, great. Uh, streaming money, awesome. Uh, uh, interoperability between wallets. You know, we, uh, we still can't send money between, you know, Venmo and Cash App or, you know, between, it's like having a, 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 an email account with Gmail and not being able to send an email to someone else with another domain on Yahoo or whatever it is. And, you know, those are real problems that can be solved with Lightning. And as I like to say, necessity is the mother of adoption, right? So if somebody can pay for their coffee easily today, that might not be the most compelling use case, but both in places where people don't have access, emerging markets, mobile money, cross-border interoperability, and then the use cases that weren't previously possible, well, if you couldn't do it before, there's a need, and Lightning provides that and solves that. So my take is that we will see, and we are seeing, you know, this emerging market adoption, the cross-border adoption, machine to machine, people built apps with like ChatGPT, Stable Diffusion, and otherwise natively integrating Lightning. There's a protocol or we built out called L402, like HTTP 402, where you can authenticate with the payment itself. And a lot of excitement around the web native uh, AI use cases as well that are emerging. A, a quick example that's just like so cool that, that I really love too, that um, it's not, not just beneficial. I, I agree the, the cross border and whatnot is amongst the most exciting to me, but even as an American too, when I was in Kenya in December, the ability to go to a, a local restaurant and pay out in M-Pesa enabled by the Lightning Network and these partnerships that I've been talking about was just like, it was kind of mind blowing. And I think we'll continue to see a convergence of all these disparate systems converging on this open protocol. And I think that's really, really good for the world. Yeah, Miles and I were at the first Africa Bitcoin conference in Ghana in December, and it just was so fascinating to see uh, the Lightning Network integrated into mobile money uh, and, and how that was just like enabling this whole other level of adoption. And, and the continent is really a fascinating place in terms of just like native use cases. A quick shout out, we don't have time to get into this. Uh, Lynn Alden wrote an incredible piece, like implications of open monetary and information information networks getting into the idea of decentralized social uh, media, uh, you know, intersecting with this space. But the last thing I want to ask, because it's, you know, important thing to think about, um, a channel-based payment network still is very complicated, right? I mean, you've got the Moon Wallet recently struggled a bit as a result of prioritizing UX over pure actual lightning. And yes, like there, I mean, we've like, we've riffed on a lot of the benefits of the Lightning Network and what that will enable for payments. But to play devil's advocate here, um, I, I do feel like the user experience for Lightning is tough. You, you know, I mean, you got USDT on Tron payments and that's just as cheap. It's also super liquid. And I think that that's the other headwind when I think about, um, you know, the Lightning Network, there's not a ton of liquidity sitting on the nodes right now. So what do you, what do you say to someone who? I was just talking with David backstage about this and Bitcoin over the years has made very intentional strategic choices to limit the attack surface. And it's hard to develop on Bitcoin. We see that every day across our various companies, but it's an intentional decision because we believe that that is what it allows it to maintain a really small attack surface. And so like creating a new global monetary system from nothing is, like, is gonna be a long task and we wanna ensure resiliency from day one. And so that, that's why I'm so, so excited about having incredible builders like David, like Elizabeth and everybody else across the yeah. industry joining us in this mission. Yeah, for us, I mean, everything you mentioned is exactly what we're doing, which is basically taking something that has the principles that Miles talked about of decentralization, minimizing the attack surface, decentralization, uh, but making it really easy. So, you know, the, the, the way that our clients use our platform is basically that they don't have to manage channels, they don't have to manage liquidity, they don't have to manage inbound liquidity, they don't have to think about whether they have enough liquidity or not. Like, we have a product, LightSpark Predict, that does exactly that for them. They'll, it, it'll find the right route, it'll deploy liquidity dynamically, it'll take care of all of these things, so you can just put your Bitcoin on your node and send and receive uh, you know, in seconds, basically, for payments in a reliable, scalable way. And, and so making it easy will drive more adoption. Driving more adoption will, in turn, drive consumer adoption. And, you know, we will, we will I think, you know, between now and next year when we gather again, we'll be, we'll be in a much better place when it comes to lightning adoption. And one of the things I've always been passionate about is abstracting complexity from the user. And here's a question. Who knows how the credit card system works, like actually? 
because I don't. Who knows how the banking system works, right? Well, we've learned a little bit more lately. And by the way, people used to say that, you know, uh, banks were too risky for Bitcoin, you know, uh, sorry, Bitcoin was too risky for banks, and now banks are too risky for Bitcoin, right? So actually, it turns out Bitcoin's a safe, secure thing, and your bank might go out of business at any point. So from my standpoint, we're building out the tools, you know, Lightning addresses, shout out to Andre Neves, um, Bolt 12. There are all sorts of ways that we're building toward usability. There will be complexity, but abstracting it is key to what, you know, Miles, David, we're building the base layer and the, the protocol layer. And then we have, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of companies, thousands of developers building that out for the end users so that they don't need to know what a channel is. They don't need to know what liquidity is. They just, it should just work. Make they can it. send and receive, you know, eventually they can have these Bitcoinized dollars to transact. And then at the end of the day, they just send over the Lightning Network. They probably won't even know about Lightning. They may not even know about Bitcoin. It can be abstracted away. It's internet money natively where they can transact globally. And we're building that out. And again, the internet, you know, 1969 ARPANET. It wasn't until the early 90s we had the web. Today, people just, you know, use their computers in their pockets. We are on the path there with Bitcoin and Lightning. We're getting there. And it'll, it's a journey, right? And we're working really hard to make it usable, but it's not, it's an evolution. Thank you so much to the panelists and to the audience and the conference for having us. Have a good rest of the day, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm Pete Rizzo, editor of Bitcoin Magazine. We're here at the Bitcoin Magazine live desk presented by Marathon. It's industry day here at Bitcoin 2023, and I'm joined once again by a new round of special guests to my left. Optimus Fields, host of Simply Bitcoin. To his left, Walker America, one half of the crypto couple on Twitter and TikTok. And to his left, last but not least, Guy Swan, host of Bitcoin Audible. Guys, the topic is the Lightning Network, quick primer, layer two for Bitcoin scaling, often billed as a payments network. We heard from the former Facebook uh, stablecoin lead, we were talking about this backstage, calling Libra a failure, uh, coming out with some strong words, dedicating the rest of his life to Bitcoin. Let's talk about Bitcoin's transition from being a digital gold to now a medium exchange. Uh, Opti, you want to kick us off? Yeah, I thought it was very interesting that David Marcus, like, very bluntly said, uh, we tried to roll out this digital payment system called Libra, and uh, it didn't work. But the reason that we didn't do that is because Lightning wasn't ready. And now he's fully dedicated himself to Lightning. And I know, I know everyone out there, all my friends are like, uh, I can't really trust him because he's coming from Facebook and all this stuff. <laughs> but uh, I mean, hey, maybe, you know, I, I believe in second chances. And he's probably seeing that Lightning is ready. Lightning simply works. And I think all of us using Lightning every single day mm. agree the same thing. Well, he's saying it's, it's ready for enterprise. Exactly. And he's got some big talk there. Guy, your take, uh, a Lightning Network user yourself? Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, I use, it's, it's funny, they talked about like the, the friction and the delays and everything in ACH and how it's still, I think he said 15% of transactions still occur over ACH. It's funny as somebody who uses Bitcoin and Lightning both more in frequency every day and, in, and also in just value and amount. Like I keep as little as in the bank, I, I'm just, I'm always waking up wondering maybe my bank is insolvent today, honestly. Um, and so I use Bitcoin and Lightning way more than I use the banking system. Um, and in doing so, whenever I do have to go back and send an ACH or something, like it's absolutely painstaking. The amount of frictions and things that I have to take care of or whatever, it's just, it's awful. Interesting, well we're winding down there talking about Bitcoinized dollars as well, a world where you might transact on Bitcoin but not be aware of it. Walker, interested in your take. Yeah, I mean, I think that we have a lot of different companies who are like some of the ones on stage building towards this right now. Strike is doing an incredible job of that. Obviously, we've seen them expanding their territorial reach, their geographic reach, offering their services in more countries, using Bitcoin, using the Lightning Network as the rails, the monetary rails. And whether or not you're transacting in U.S. dollars or any other currency around the world, you are using Bitcoin, but not realizing that you're having the power of that instant global settlement and you're transacting at the speed of light. So seeing more and more companies start to pop up and work towards that goal of not just Bitcoin as the money, but Bitcoin as the rails. Mm. I think that becomes very powerful, especially as we get towards the more, uh, let's say, corporate use cases. Well, certainly interesting to see it coming coming to life. Uh, smash that subscribe button, give us a rumble on Rumble. We're gonna send it back to the main stage over at Nakamoto.